Hi, I'm Dave Annell. Welcome to episode 14 of Setting the Record Straight, which was inspired by the discovery of one of the worst examples of digitization that I've ever come across. Allow me to explain. I've been doing a lot of research recently involving the early English settlement, or rather invasion, of the North American continent. In episode six, I looked at an example of some particularly bad research into the origins of an early settler in New England. So I feel it's only right that I should redress the balance here, because much of the work done in this area in the past 40 or 50 years is of an exceptionally high standard. I want to draw your attention in particular to the work of the New England Historic Genealogical Society, much of which is now accessible through their website, American Ancestors. The resource that I've been using most often over the past few days is the Great Migration Database, which we can access in a number of ways. I'll just uh, go here and we see uh, it's available there in various volumes. Um, it lists the 5,000 or so men and women who are known to have crossed the Atlantic in the years 1634 and 1635 to settle in New England. It's a remarkable piece of work. The authors, Robert Charles Anderson and George and Melinda Sanborn, have researched each of the migrants and attempted to piece together their life stories from original sources. Now you can see the work was originally published in seven volumes between 1999 and 2011, and there are plenty of gaps when it comes to the English origins of the migrants, many of which could probably be filled now that we have such easy access to the relevant primary sources in the UK. Nevertheless, I would suggest that it should be your starting point for any research in this area. Now, one of the people I was interested in was a man called Barnaby or Barnabas Davis, who arrived in Massachusetts in 1635. So we can access his record by clicking here and we could put in his name there. I've already downloaded the relevant entries and this is what it looks like. You can see what a huge amount of information the authors have compiled. And it's all evidence-based analytical forensic research all properly referenced with explanations of why they've arrived at specific conclusions. There's information about his birth, speculating about when he was born with evidence of age taken from various documents and details of his death. They also have his marriage to Patience James in Tewkesbury, Gloucestershire on the 1st of July, 1628. What I was particularly interested in was the list of Barnaby's children, the first of which, the first four of which were born in England. Dates of baptism are provided for three of them, and I wanted to check the original parish register entries, partly to confirm the dates, but also to see if there were any other clues in the entries. Unlikely at this period, I know, but I always like to check. So I went to the Gloucestershire Parish Register database on Ancestry and tried a basic search. So I'm just going to put in surname Davis, and we'll put in... Well, the name we're looking for is Barnabas or Barnaby. So we'll just put in B asterisk R N like that. It's a wild card. So that should pick up any variants of Barnabas. We'll run that search. And you can see that we've only got one result. Um, now, it's the baptism of the fourth of the children, Patience Davis, baptised on the 21st of December 1636 in Tewkesbury. Uh, the father's name has been recorded here as Barnard uh, and the mother as Patience. If we view the image, you can see down here, this is the entry. Patience, the daughter of, well, it, it says Barnaby. It's, just, it's, not Barn, it's not Barnard, it's Barnaby and Patience Davis. So that's one of the four. So we should, in theory, be able to find baptisms for two of the other three. We can see from the Great Migration database here that Samuel was baptised at Tetbury on the 26th of June, 1629, and James was baptised the same place on the 17th of October, 1633. So why wasn't I finding them? Why did that basic search not turn up what we were expecting? Well, we can have a look back at the database here and try a few other basic searches. We could just try leaving out the surname completely, put in the father's name, the wild card for, for Barnaby, and put in the word Tetbury in the keyword there. We'll search that, 
and you see there's nothing at all that looks relevant. So we could try instead just putting in the year 1629 and the parish Tetbury in the keyword and run that search. And this time we'll see there are no matches at all, suggesting that there's nothing in the database for Tetbury for 1629. There's actually an explanation for that because the parish register doesn't start till 1631. And it seems that the entry for that 1629 baptism is actually taken from a bishop's transcript, which is not part of this database. But let's try for the 1633 entry and see what happens there. Well, this time we've got 13 results and there's some pretty strange looking names there, which doesn't particularly fill you with confidence. There's also no precise dates for any of these baptisms. And it only it looks like there's only one where there's any sort of parental detail recorded here. This uh, curiously named Mary Sonder, whose father was apparently called James. This is a results list which bears all the hallmarks of really bad digitization. First thing we need to do is to have a look at the register itself to see if we can work out what's going on. And it's interesting, there is actually an Anne Davis on the list. So we'll click on that entry there. And we have dropped onto the page for baptisms in 1633. And the first thing we can see straight away is that there are far more than 13 entries on this page for the year 1633. And in fact, if we go back a page to the previous page, we can see there's a number of entries there for 1633. In fact, there are 21 on this page here and a further 27 on the, the second page. So that's a total of 48 entries, but our search only produced 13 results. So there's clearly something very wrong here. So it's time to look at the transcripts using the toggle index panel button at the foot of the page. This brings up the, the results for the, the details that have been transcribed from this page. And we've got here the, the entry for Anne Davis at the top, but it's not clear immediately where that entry is uh, on the page. I can't see an Anne Davis. But the, the entry underneath this on the transcribed list is Robert Boog, that familiar old English surname Boog. And we can pretty clearly see that this is what they've read as Robert Boog. It's actually Robert Hooper. That's a contraction for the ER. So it's Robert Hooper, the son of Austin Hooper. You can see the surname's written out in full there. So that's that entry there. But the entry underneath that is Anne Gerlock. And you can see that if you go four entries down, there's an entry for Anne Garlic. So there's something very, very strange going on here. If we go back to the top of the page, we can see the first entry on the transcription is Elizabeth Sameby. But the entry here we can read as Elizabeth Harding. The next one is a bit harder. It looks like it's probably Henry Warren. And then we've got a Joseph Hodges. But the, the second entry here is Joseph Garabet. Um, very, very odd. The fourth entry is Thomas Clevery, and we've got a Thomas Williams here, but then Samuel Robb, well, that's Hannah Hobbs. The symbol here isn't an E, it's a, an ES character. Then we've got Ambrose Johnson, but there's nothing for an Ambrose Johnson. Lydia, difficult, that surname, probably Isle. John Pike, William Savage. Ah, now there's James Davis, the son of Barnaby Davis. So that's the entry that we were looking for. That's probably the one that's been transcribed as Anne Davis. But then we've got Alice Ind, Robert Hooper, Hannah Brazenton, I think. Uh, this one's difficult. John Darby, the son of Adam Darby. And then we've got a, a Francis, it looks like, Francis Butterby, Anne Garlic and so on, all the way down the page. There are lots of names here, but very few of them have actually been captured in any way. We come right down here, and we come into 1634, <clears throat> the first entry there, Deborah Tanner has been transcribed as Vebra Cumber, whose father is apparently called Cumber Cumber. In fact, of course, it's Deborah Tanner, daughter of Arthur Tanner. Very, very bad transcription.
but it's not just bad transcription. And I'm not usually that worried about bad transcription as such. It would be nice if these 17th and 16th century registers could be transcribed by experts, but I don't think that that would work in Ancestry's pile them high, sell them cheap financial model. So we need to make the most of what we've got. And usually you'll find that the transcribers have got enough of the entry right to allow us to find what we're looking for. We just need to learn how to take control of our searches, use the keyword field or restrict the search to a particular year or years. Try entering just the first name or the surname or play around with the father's name. Remember always less is more. The process should allow you to identify some possible entries, which you can then look at in the original document to see if they could possibly be what you're looking for. But in the case of this Tetbury register, we can't even do that. For most of the entries on the page, there simply isn't an equivalent transcription. Now, I haven't looked at the rest of the register or at the other registers in this database, so I don't know how widespread the problem is. I'd be interested to hear from Gloucestershire researchers about their experiences. All I know is that that particular page is one of the worst examples of transcription and digitization that I've ever come across. That's all for me from now. Thanks for listening. Watch out for the next episode of Setting the Record Straight, coming your way soon. <laughs>